coming back to my home state of Queensland, uh, got into the cotton industry as a chipper, chipping weeds out of rows of cotton. And uh, fortunately, we don't do that anymore. Um, but anyway, it was a it was a great grounding, and it was a very vibrant and exciting industry to be part of. Um, so, uh, skip forward thirty some years from there. Um, I'm now in the Northern Territory and I was tasked as farm manager at Tipperary Station to find the silver bullet that David calls it, uh, crop for Tipperary Station. I don't know that it's a silver bullet, but it's a very good fit for what we're trying to do. Um, some of the things that cotton benefits us um, at Tipperary is uh, not the least, not in the least at all, is weed control. So uh, genetic modifications in the cotton industry in the last 25 years uh, insect management and being able to overspray the crop with glyphosate or being Roundup ready. Um, that's a major component of our cropping system at Tipperary is being able to overspray with Roundup. <coughs> We're getting a control on pastures, uh, sorry, on gamma grass there, which has been gamma grass for 30 some years. Um, and in the places where we've grown cotton now, there's not a stalk of gamma grass. So I know that a lot of the cattlemen in the room will say that there's nothing wrong with gamma grass as far as feed value goes, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, one guy made a comment to me that you can't, nothing else will fatten cattle on a gravel quarry. Well, I agree with that too. But when you're loving gamma grass, come up and give me a hand to fight the gamma grass fires. That's, that's not something we really need in the industry either. So there are better things to have than gamma grass um, for your feed. And one of those is the, is the spin-off of growing cotton, which is the cotton seed. Uh, this is something that shouldn't be underplayed or downplayed uh, for the Northern Territory or for any Northern reaches of Australia, um, right across the top of Queensland, Northern Territory and West Australia. Uh, we all suffer um, the wet season, the dry season and the fire season right across the top. And in the dry season, you're no stranger to the fact that your cattle will need supplementary feeding. And <coughs> They need a protein source, and the cotton seed is excellent at providing that. Um, the, the information is available there. You're still going to need some of those micronutrients, micro elements, um, uh, so you'll still have to truck that in, but the seed, the protein, the bigger part of, of that mix will be <coughs> available in the coming years. Um, we also see uh, the cotton industry as actually taking off from this point forward in the Northern Territory. Now, by taking off, I don't, I don't mean that I think there'll be an expansion of 60,000 hectares in the coming planting, because unfortunately, we still have to truck our product into state for processing, and I'm coming to that. Um, but the, uh, the taking off will be that uh, we started with um, a 50 hectare trial in 2019. Um, we moved that to 300 hectares in 2020. And in 2021, our planting will be 1,500 hectares. That's just us at Tipperary. I know that there are other bigger or as big players in the Northern Territory who are looking at similar size plantings. Um, so it's, it's going forward, it's moving forward. Um, now let me move on briefly to the cotton gin um, and the processing plant for our product. Um, David couldn't be here today, but uh, he's asked me to pass on um, a couple of key points surrounding the cotton gin. Now, we've managed to form a steering committee or a, or a, grow, a steering group, I suppose is a better word, not a committee yet, but a steering group of current farmers and farmers who are very likely to drop seed from the ground this year to um, guide the construction of a cotton gin up here. Now, Cotton gin will cost anywhere between 10 and 40 million dollars. Um, and it's a very broad statement and it's very easy and doesn't sound like much when you say it quickly, but it's a lot of money. So uh, where we are at is, is we have commissioned a group of people to do an engineering report on a second hand cotton gin and a brand new cotton gin and give us their uh, recommendations. Um, regardless of that outcome, we are committed to ginning or processing 
local copy in 22. So what that means is that um, for those of you who will plant, who will, who will look at planting, if you're planting in December of 2021, that harvested crop in 2022 can be processed in the Northern Territory. So that's our commitment uh, moving forward. Um, we will, we are looking for uh, commitment for throughput to the gin. Um, what keeps the cotton gin alive is throughput modules going through the gin. Um, uh, so there is a major investor now and, and that major investor is Tipperary Station. Um, and as such, our big boss, Alan Myers, has told David that it's best if he is in charge of, or, or at least chairing the steering group who are going to put this together. So the, um, the ownership model currently is a grower-owned gin. Now, that's not a co-op, uh, it's not merchant-owned, it's a grower-owned gin. So any profits and any benefits of that gin goes back to the growers. So um, if I can explain it as quickly as I can, the, the fact that there will be major shareholders, um, such as Tipperary Group, that won't be the case going forward. So there'll be a major shareholder for seed funding to initially construct the cotton gin, then those shareholdings will be sold down to a similar level to every other grower, commensurate with their throughput. So um, we're not looking for any one entity to own the cotton gin. All the benefits need to be passed on to the growers. Um, it's a really good model. It's worked really well in other regions. Um, and the guys that we're discussing it with at the moment, um, it, it, their gin is actually a grower-owned gin, 100% grower-owned. So it's managed by a board of directors and then there's a general manager of the cotton gin um, who takes his direction from the board of directors. So. Uh, I guess quickly any, any questions, anything that I haven't covered on that. Um, we're looking at possibly four different sites um, throughout the Northern Territory. We haven't settled on any one yet. Obviously Catherine is among those four sites and then uh, the next three move north along the Stewart Highway. Um, I don't know that there's much more that I can add, but if you've got a question at least pertaining to the gin, let's, um, let's hear something. Nothing? Oh, Bruce, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for that good news. Um, Bruce, a question. In 2022, how many bales would you like to have produced? 160,000, Bruce. That's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> um, look, 160,000 is obviously a pipe dream. Um, a cotton gin needs minimum 60,000 bales throughput consistently to maintain the cotton gin. Uh, we know we're not going to be there in 2022, uh, we'll probably be fairly far from it. Um, we have been in touch with the uh, Ord River growers, the Ord Valley growers, I beg your pardon, and they um, um, pretty much to a farmer have, have committed their cotton, or committed to supporting a cotton gin wherever it is. Now moving forward, my own personal opinion of this is that there will be a gin in both regions. Um, but the Kununurra gin might be a little way down the track, uh, but the guys have shortage of supply over there. So uh, we need 60,000 bales. Um, we're not going to be there first up, so the gin will have a couple of years running on the wrong side of the ledger, I'm sure, um, but throughput is king. So we really need a commitment, and that commitment would be, um, we would be asking for an ongoing commitment, and we are also, I'm available today for anyone who knows of anyone who would who um, would have an interest in um, being a shareholder in the gin straight up. Come and see me at any time. If you want that conversation to be confidential, it can be. Just slip your phone number into my pocket and we'll talk about it later on. Um, I know it's not always easy in a public forum like this, but <coughs> absolutely, we are 100% committed at this stage to ginning local cotton in 22. Okay, um, we move on a little bit further. Have a look at my notes. Uh, just further 
to um, something I heard Sam speaking about earlier. Uh, the, cotton, the cotton industry is very collaborative, um, so we're all open to uh, those of us who have, who have grown cotton and have a bit of experience in the game, are very open to helping those who are uh, fledgling in the industry and, and want to learn a little bit more about it. So it's as simple as get on the phone. Um, and why that is, is because we're competing on a world market, we're not competing against our neighbour for a local market. Um, I'm not competing against Chris Howie for pay sales to Bridge Creek or something like that. So it's a world market and every bale of cotton in Australia is exported every year. There's no ginormous stockpiles anywhere that we're trying to get rid of. At this stage, it's a very sought after product. Um, I had talks just recently with a major grower from southern areas and uh, he's saying that um, Australian cotton is is commanding a premium on the market and is is very uh, very well sought after, very strongly sought after. So uh, we're in the box seat to be growing really good cotton in northern Australia. We're also very very close to our markets when compared with southern regions. Um, uh, something that's come out of um, Darwin recently is, or maybe not so recently, is the fact that there's. Um, 200,000 bales worth of empty space. Now a cotton bale, similar to wool bale, 227 kilos when it's processed and it's lint only. So that's what we talk about when we talk about a bale of cotton. The module is the round yellow wrapped or pink wrapped um, pile of cotton that you see on the back of the truck. So there was some over in the service station here this morning. Couldn't have been a better advertisement. Um, so there's 200,000 bales worth of empty space currently being exported out of China, out of Darwin, Port of Darwin, as empty containers going to China. Um, China is still our biggest market for cotton, but it's not our only market of cotton, for cotton. All those empty containers go to Singapore, and then they redirect it from there. So if we develop a market in Indonesia, or Vietnam, or Malaysia, it still goes through Singapore and gets redirected, but it's close, it's only just there. Um, and there's already empty space going out. Yes, the demarrage out of Port of Darwin is relatively expensive when compared with southern ports, uh, but um, throughput will change that as well. So that's the collaboration and the market, um, and we'll have uh, Pete come up and speak a little bit more on the marketing of the cotton shortly. Um, the other thing Sam talked about was the share farming operation. If you think, um, or you know somebody who is interested in getting into cotton but they're, they're unsure of it because they don't know anything about it, and it's similar with any farming enterprise in the Northern Territory, um, if you don't know anything about it but you really want to have a go at it, well, have a talk, have a talk to us, get in touch with us at Northern Cotton Growers Association, uh, northerncottongrowers at gmail.com, um, or one of the current growers, look, there's, there's a great deal of interest from southern regions into um, how those guys can help. Um, and that might be a, sh a share farming operation, might be a joint venture. Uh, it'll be a joint venture of one form or another. But let me say this, and it's a pretty heavy duty, but um, write down your expectations before you do it and have a think about it, before you have the discussion. Because whatever joint venture you get into, you have to be comfortable with it. Don't, you don't want to get a year into a five year agreement and be arguing with your share farmer. And, and similarly, the share farmer needs to write down his expectations. You need to, we, we don't want to discuss the money ever, but you've got to discuss the money because that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're in business to make a few dollars. So you've got to discuss the money, you've got to discuss the hard parts of that agreement and if you, if you can't reach an agreement, that doesn't mean that you hate each other's guts. That just means that you didn't reach an agreement. You've got two, two different sets of expectations. If you do reach a, an agreement, that's great. Make sure you talk about it regularly and, and work something out. You don't ever want to get into the situation. Believe me, I've been in the situation. It, it can get very ugly because you could, and, and we did it the wrong way. We didn't, we didn't table our expectations. We had a set of expectations while we share farming wheat in southern Queensland. We had a set of expectations. The, the property owner had a set of expectations. We didn't discuss it. We were stupid. It didn't work out well for us. So, anyway, I really, I really meant that there's some really good people in the industry who can help, and there's some really good landholders up here who can help 
those who want to get into the share fund. But for God's sake, discuss the hard topics. Discuss it over a beer. Make it light. You, you, you're not you're not at each other's throats yet, and you don't want to get there. So you really have to discuss it. Um, and yeah, I don't know. They're not about that enough. But it, it's a really important point because the share farming can really help the industry grow. Um, but we've got to do it right. Everybody has to be comfortable with the decision that they've made. Okay, um, that's probably enough for a little while from me. I will speak again shortly, um, but I'll come back to answer some questions, but we've got to move along a bit. So I might uh, ask Stephen Yates to come up and say a few words on their, on their project, please. <laughs>